Egypt, I think it was, uh, really just calming Calm people down, down and calming things down. And uh, that may be the hidden sort of structural thing, but it was that, you know, that great willingness to open her arms and to make it so simple, because it really was very simple. <laughs> uh, I, I, I talked about Ellen, uh, who I knew for many years, and Ellen and Margaret, Martha were great friends. And never once did Ellen Stewart come to me and say, Philip, I have this wonderful show you've got to come see called The Yellow House. Wow. It was always, guess what Leo Shapiro is doing next? Right. Come see Leo. Right. And Martha really did respond to individuals that was right at the core of the ethos of what ITI is about. This very simple thing, you know, we meet each other and we change. It's pretty powerful. Great. And it all started with this great picture of this great young woman. <laughs> great. Well, that's fantastic. Um, I guess we'll talk to some more people for a few more minutes. Good. Um, thanks. Thanks. Um, I think next up we were going to talk to Anne Bogart. My daughter. His daughter, Anne Bogart. Um, everyone knows Anne as. Oh, you're all right. See, uh, one of the assistant, as one of the, so the uh, artistic directors of City Company, and she's uh, currently at Columbia University. How are you? Good. Good. So, do you have any particular thoughts? I know you're going to be speaking in about 20 minutes or something, mm -hmm. but do you have any particular thoughts that you'd like to share about Martha and, and yeah, the well, importance? Yeah. Well, when you asked Philip. Who was Martha? What did she do? I mean, I know you know everyone knows the answer to that. I thought, what would what would my answer to that be? And so I thought, you know what she was? She was what? Um, who was it who who categorized all human beings into like five or six different categories? Yeah. Was it Malcolm Gladwell or somebody? Yeah, yeah. And one of those was some somebody called a Maven, and the Maven is is the person who is the seed for uh, plants that grow is, is if you, and I think it's true with Martha, if you looked at a lot of movements in the American theater over the last 40 years, you would find Martha at the bottom of it. And she wouldn't claim it because she would, would say, no, 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 that happened because other people, but she was the person who, and I think, I think it's true what Philip said, that it was very simple. She just made everything very simple. Well, of course. <laughs> it was never like well, that's, that's difficult. That's a kind of a creepy imitation of uh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, we'll do it again. We should, we should all just take it on and carry it forward. Yeah. Well, of course. <laughs> um, and and she was that person who 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 said, well, of course, and things started to happen. Yeah. And then she denied having anything to do with it later on. Is that true? Well, she was in her own way modest. Yeah. And she was not a grandstanding person at all. She was a great party thrower. Mm -hmm. She put people together who never would have met otherwise unless they had met them through Martha. She was a maven and a connector. What is it they also call it in, in uh, the world of, 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 of Jewish, Jewish marriage? A, a, uh, what is it? Uh, somebody who gets people to marry each other? Yenta. A yenta. She was a yenta in many ways, not in terms of literal marriages, but in terms of artistic marriages. Mm -hmm. And again, she, if you asked her if it was because of her, she would probably laugh. And she wouldn't say, of course, to that. She'd say, right. no, 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 these people got together. Right. So right. we'll miss her, and I think it's our obligation to look at exactly what she did and to answer your questions as clearly as we can and say, that's what we carry forward. Those are the memes. Those are the tropes. That's what's alive still. And one can, one can do that can by you, identifying what those things are. Can you do it now? Can you do what she does, what she did in the current? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say it. I, of course, <laughs> tremble at the thought of saying that because right. it's not, it's, we all know, actually, it's not so simple. Right. That nothing is simple, and we live in a very, very complex time. But there have to be people who have that uh, positivism and that sense of can do, and the, the, the humor that is actually the, uh, the motor behind it that allows things to happen. And without that humor, again, Philip is somebody who also shares that 
sense of humor, if you can't laugh at the difficulties and throw your arms up and, uh, uh, and, 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 and just move forward in a state of everybody else's stuckness, right. you know, then, then that's the kind of thing we need to take on from her example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Great. Well, that, thank you. Good. That's great. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Um, I guess next up would be Jim O'Quinn. Um, why not? He's got a drink in his hand. Why not? Um, and uh, of course, many of you will know Jim as the uh, editor of American Theatre. What are you called now? Are you like a? They, a they, they've labeled me founding editor. Founding American editor, sure. which he was. He was yeah. founding editor of American Theatre magazine, yeah. Yeah. and uh, currently resides in New Orleans. Um, do you have any thoughts about? About well, I watched all those years. Uh, I, can, yeah. I can never be as eloquent as Anne, of course. Uh, and all the things she said are absolutely true. But I watched Martha all those years, uh, you know, make enormous difference uh, in the theater and, uh, and bringing internationalism into the American scene. Yeah, that... Because I mean, you would have a you would have a certain viewpoint about that being at the core of the American theater in a certain way because of TCG. What what did did she influence American theater in a certain sort of way? Do you think? I mean, did did she do something? What did she do something specifically to the American theater? Because what we well, I think without her there would be a, a lot less cross cross feeding. You know, it's it's changed from time to time. There were in in the eighties, for instance, there was lots of. Uh, back and forth and the 90s became kind of xenophobic and closed off and right. then it changed again but Martha was always there uh, pushing and she would uh, she would kept well you know I remember uh, lots of specific things has anyone mentioned the brownies no no one's mentioned Martha the brownies, made yeah. the best brownies <laughs> best chocolate brownies that anybody ever made even my grandmother couldn't match them and she would bring them to TCG big boxes of them and we would all we would all be you know at our computers with dirty chocolate stained fingers you know uh, after that and and everybody would line up for them but and she always wanted people to you know be be well supplied and happy and mm -hmm. uh, you know um, and the the main aside from the professional relationship that I had with her when she would come by and and, and when we did work things together. The time I got to, the most intimate time I ever spent with Martha was when we took a four-hour road trip uh, up from New York, just she and I in a rent-a-car to go to Double Edge Theater, which was one of her, up in Western Massachusetts, which was one of her favorite uh, companies and a place that she loved. And so I had Martha all to myself for four solid hours, and we talked and talked and talked, and she talked more than I talked. <laughs> <laughs> because she was a hell of a talker, yeah. and um, and I remember that time with enormous affection, and um, and uh, you know I don't know how to summarize. Uh, I couldn't begin to summarize what what she did, yeah. but uh, as Anne said, she'll be enormously missed. Yeah, yeah, great, thanks. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to get uh, Will Wadsworth up here if I could um, to give a sort of different perspective about about Martha. Um, Will is, is Martha's uh, nephew. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, and I, I just thought maybe you could give us, um, we, 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 we all kind of know the professional end of things with Martha, but perhaps you could talk a little bit about who she, where she came from as a, as a uh, you know, from, a, from the, the, the <laughs> The family tree kind of thing, I suppose, or something like that. Obviously, we don't, we can't go into the genealogy of the Wadsworth family necessarily, but, but, <laughs> but, but you, you have some thoughts, I think, about about her upbringing and where she came from and that sort of thing. Well, I, I got to know her really be best when she was on her last decline after two strokes, and I was a sort of a on-site caretaker. And she had more situational awareness than almost anyone I knew after two strokes. So she always knew what people were feeling. She had huge empathy and was able to relate to anyone. And she struggled. I mean, part of the cause of those strokes was um, a kind of uh, 
a deep sadness that she had for many years after her husband died and various other things. Mm -hmm. And she struggled with drink. She, was, she had a drink in her hand from the day she was born because her father was a wonderful cocktail host. And social fun was the name of the game in our family. But she, um, um, she struggled with alcoholism a little bit later, and that was part of the greatness of her, that she really understood the struggle of life, the struggle of other people, the great empathy she had for people. And towards the end of her life, she learned the lessons of alcohol and uh, got free of it. Um, but for her, the way to improve the world and to improve people was one day at a time, one action at a time, and one person at a time. That was Martha through, through, and through. She was a very present-oriented person, very contact-oriented. And a lot of that sort of, um, at the root of that, that people don't see and don't know is her deep, deep faith. She had faith in people. She had incredible confidence in herself because of her, she was born kind of with a silver spoon, went to Vassar, was surrounded by very self-entitled people and that and was the main trait of the family through the generations was that um, women need to be educated and they were educated from 1636 to the present and they got college educations as soon as we found colleges in this country and Wadsworth men love smart women so it's that's what she came out of she came out not only entitled, but um, authorized to be herself fully. And I think she, she was willing to act that out. And she used that background for a good cause. It wasn't, as you say, she wasn't a proud person. She knew her weaknesses. And I think that Rudy, her husband, gave her a lot of strength to face the international scene, which she might have otherwise, without Rosamund Gilder there, she might not have ever gone there. But together, they had a synergy that allowed her to say, yes, you can take an international role. Um, but she was sort of born to it to some extent and, and educated to, into it. But she took it much further because she was the first post-war generation woman. She was in a Wadsworth experiment um, <laughs> post-war. The, the war ruined the extended family. And, a lot of families drifted through World War I thinking nothing had happened because America wasn't bombed or shot at. And, but the war, um, she lost an uncle, uh, and um, her two brothers were faced World War II. She was young, and it was, didn't affect her, but she was going to have fun, and everyone came back from the war ready for fun. Mm -hmm. so, you also told me once about so, um, you thought there was a she had almost a crisis of faith at one point, and that was around the time when she actually, when she went to, when she went to ITI, actually. Well, I think we see, the same time, we right? see uh, right now with the heroin e epidemic in America and these other things that young people like to live, <laughs> and they like to experiment, and like to try things, and she was ready for living. She lived hard. She was at theater all night, worked all day, um, partied hard, um, was in transformative theater workshops that were very transformative. They really woke her she up. Was an actor, the actor she studio. was at the actor's studio, and she met great actors and loved them. And she, she would do anything for a fellow actor. Acting was more her actor friends and her, like you, her, her friends in theater were more important to her than her family, to be honest. She had the family background. She was a loyal family member. But her theater family was the, was the family. And that was her great strength, I think, because she treated everyone like she had been treated in her family, and she took everyone into her family. So that's just, sorry to broadcast, but I've been thinking a lot about her, yeah. and I've been thinking about yeah. her in the w deeper context of the family. I think hard drinking and hard living and trying things out in the sexual revolution or pre-sexual revolution drove her into a black pit um, as she was getting other actors into the workplace and drinking a lot and seeing theater a lot and 
not knowing where she was completely didn't her lifestyle wasn't adding up to something until Rosamond Gilder and some other very wise theater people took her that took her under their wing and she began to get a direction but at the root of that like all my ancestors who have fallen they had a very strong Puritan Protestant background. We had three ministers in the uh, two ministers in the family. They they came over for religious reasons. They stayed religious. So the the Puritanism in the family and the Presbyterian church every Sunday and so forth that she grew up with. Um, she went back to the church. She went back to St. Clement's, which was an experimental religious and church theater community. And she, her letters about that to the Presbyterian minister of her father's church are worth reading because she said, I found my family, I found my spiritual home at St. Clement's, and I'm not disrespecting the spiritual home I came from, and I'm writing to tell you that I'm fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You know? So she found a balance between the new world and the old world um, through St. Clement's and through her faith. So she had a deep, deep Christian faith. And I think that was the root of her coming out of, it was the root of her understanding all the other people with faith. She wasn't uh, prejudiced at all. And she was in a church that welcomed um, LGBT families um, um, way before, way before AIDS. The, uh, she was, she was way ahead of the curve on all that. She had no, she was strong in her own faith and she just rediscovered her own faith. So through that, I think she was able to reach out to people of other faiths with that great confidence and that great faith in, in God. She was never religious or phony religious. Um, but as she said, um, the only two days I need God are on Monday morning and Thursday afternoon. <laughs> 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 and um, since we're all in church on Sunday, uh, since we're all in church on Sunday, I, I think God should take a seventh, uh, the day off on the seventh day. <laughs> so it was that kind of a religion, but it was important to her, and I think yeah. that, I think it helped. Yeah, and it was around the same time that she. It was funny because I think it's it happened around the same time as when she encountered Rosamond, that's, and it was all sort of happened at the same. You know, it all sort of coalesced at that moment. To be a complete moment. idiot, I think that. God or the universe works that way that once you make that leap of trust then you can do anything yeah you're, you're free you can step out you can you can display yourself or it, or not you can be quiet and shut up you know which would be the wiser course <laughs> well that's great that gives us uh, it gives us a certain insight into her that I don't think is it, a lot of people have which is great so yeah so she had a private life but um, theater was her real life she really put her whole heart into it. Thanks. Great to see you. Um, I think we're going to wrap this up for right now. Uh, for We have to change over to actually do the, the, uh, the uh, event. So we'll be kind of pausing for about eight minutes, I think, as we, as we uh, set things up and do that transition. So hang on. We'll be back in about eight minutes. Thanks.
Everybody knows what this is. It just came up from the archives downstairs. Uh, and I was asked uh, by Mia to ring it to start today, and I feel very honored. I've heard it hundreds of times, as you all have. Uh, oh, can we hear me now? We can hear me now. All right. I won't go back. Um, this is the right place for this ceremony to happen. Uh, and Martha and Ellen were great friends. They made a long journey together. And when uh, we were looking where to land this, top of the list and the first people in were La Mama. So uh, Mia is uh, in Italy right now and can't be with us, but just a few words from the managing director, um, Mary Fulham, please. Thank you, so Thank you all so much. You know, um, as, as Philip said, you know, Ellen and, and Martha were very close, and we're so honored that, that this memorial is here tonight and would like to welcome all of you, her colleagues, and especially her family, uh, to remember Martha's remarkable life tonight here in the Ellen Stewart Theater. So we just, on behalf of all of us at La Mama, the entire team, we just want to welcome you and say how much we love Martha. Thank you so much.
right now I was going to introduce Stephen Zinzer Wadsworth. Uh, I spent the afternoon with about two dozen of Martha's blood relations, and the notion of getting her theater family and her family family together really got more exciting as every minute that I spent with them this afternoon. I hope afterwards you'll get to spend some time with them. Martha's sister is here, who I believe announced that she was 94 years old. She was Martha's big sister. Uh, it's great to have you here. And Stephen asked, uh, Stephen wanted to go first because he's getting on a plane. He's an op. So good. Please welcome, representing the Wadsworth clan, a man I first met at Sundance probably a decade ago, uh, Stephen Zinzer Wadsworth. Thank you. I know. Sorry to cut it so close. As noted, I am getting on a plane. And of course, I wasn't ready. Uh, but I'm really glad to be here on behalf of Martha and on behalf of um, the Wadsworth clan at large. <laughs> so my name is Stephen Wadsworth Zinzer. I work professionally as Stephen Wadsworth. Um, my grandmother was the only sibling of Martha's father, which makes me Martha's first cousin once removed, in a room full of various siblings, first and second cousins, once and twice removed, and of course all our theater sisters and brothers. Um, and none of us at all removed from Martha, really, except by her death, which didn't really work for me. I mean, it seems very unlikely knowing Martha that she's supine in a pine crate or reduced to ashes in an urn hardly enough to hold one of her bracelets. <laughs> <clears throat> and also I felt very close to her as I've thought about her since she died, and I don't think that's going to stop. She was a particularly vivid cousin, <laughs> and her close relationship with my late father, John Zinzer, brought her into our sphere in the 60s and 70s when I was growing up, trailing brilliantly colored scarves and trading droll urbanities with my droll urban father. <laughs> they took care of each other in the 60s um, when they each saw very hard times and delighted, as Martha seems always to have done, no matter how down her chips were, in having a drink, telling old stories, doing animal impressions. <laughs> and heaving with laughter. If her close friend and colleague Edward Albee had collaborated, say, with George S. Kaufman, they might have written Martha. <laughs> At least as she appeared to me then, wondrously complex, biting, hilarious, dear, easily moved, and clearly no stranger to dark places. It took one to know one. Martha was born June 21st, 1933, the fourth child of Charles Wadsworth III and Martha Clay Hollister, a shiny, witty, handsome pair. As Martha said, toasting them on, her 50th wedding, on their 50th wedding anniversary, they produced, quote, they produced four very noisy, talkative, stage-stealing, messy, enthusiastic shouters Anyone who has survived the participate or perish character of a little Wadsworth gathering will bear me out. <laughs> Martha was fully nine years younger than the next youngest sibling, her sister Elizabeth, who is here tonight, and grew up, in a certain sense, alone. Where her siblings came of age after Pearl Harbor, Martha came of age after Hiroshima. And upon graduating in drama from Vassar in 1954, was clearly bursting with an actor's need to tell stories and bear witness. She came from a long line of storytellers and their stories, and I can only speak for the Wadsworth side. Charles I was the Reverend Charles Wadsworth Emily Dickinson met and was deeply moved by. He was a media superstar when print was the only media. 
uh, minister of the Arch Street Church in Philadelphia, a famously eloquent writer and thinker in the age of expansion, widely read, charismatic. He was lured west to help organize lawless San Francisco during the Civil War years and embodied the courageous political awareness that is a running Wadsworth motif and was very Martha when he said, God bless the President of the United States and half of his parishioners walked out of the church. <laughs> Charles II was also a preacher, and Charles III, father to George I, Charles IV, Elizabeth I, and Martha II, <laughs> majored in nuclear chemistry at Harvard and worked for the Chemical Warfare Department in World War I. All that had to be kept secret, of course, and for a person with the moral sophistication of this enlightened, preacher's son and grandson, it must have been a heavy weight. Working for a chemical firm sometime after the war, he took lunch on a locker room bench one day, and when he got up, his pants were burned through by something on the seat, so he decided to change careers. <laughs> Martha wrote of her parents' home, between the silence and the storms, there was that which made the thunder productive, humor. Humor often hiding pain or covering feelings, but mostly a humor that never really could hide love or anger or concern. That home was ultimately in Pelham, New York, where Martha's parents were ensconced towards the end of their lives, to which their children and grandchildren returned regularly, and where, during a seemingly endless cocktail hour, there was noise, <laughs> talk, stage ceiling, and very fun shouting, in which my father was a full participant. <laughs> but one of the stars was Charles IV, who wanted to be, was, an actor. But Charles III would not allow that. It all looked like love to me, though. And the other star was Martha. She was made of theater. She was, in fact. She had played every role in the theater. She went to theater camp in Colorado where her prescient advisor said of her, quote, Martha has so many gifts, it is hard to know in which field she should give the most of her time and energy. The entire staff find her highly interesting, intelligent, and witty. <laughs> she wrote, produced, directed, and acted at Vassar and left there wanting to be an actress. She did summer stock in Ogunquit, acting and stage managing. She became Elia Kazan and Lee Strasberg's student and factotum at the Actors Studio in its Marlon Brando, Paul Newman, Carl Malden days, and seems to have been the only person who could successfully wrangle the perennially late Marilyn Monroe into coming to class on time. At Actors, there are other Marilyn Monroe stories for another time. At, at Actors Studio, she worked and networked closely with its general administrator and producer, Roger Stevens. She then worked as gopher secretary and networker extraordinaire for the, late, for the legendary agent, Gilbert Parker, all the while honing and merging her miraculous humor and diplomatic skills. And somehow, and I wish I had further details about this, managed to squeeze in a three-month European vacation with Paul and Julia Child. <laughs> the mind reels. <laughs> Ultimately, though, she struck out on her own as an actor-to-be, and, well, she struck out. <laughs> She'd also learned a lot about drinking at Actors Studio and in the warp speed company of the theater business, so she did a little bit too much of that and floundered in the early 60s which is when my dad helped her out. And she repaid that favor in spades with her love and support and hilarity when he needed it in the second part of that decade. And I also have to say, whenever I spoke to her, she <laughs> repaid it. Things got really, really good for her after that. Rosamond Gilder needed someone to organize an international theater conference in New York, quick like a bunny, and Martha was the perfect person. All of her gifts came together. Rosamond Gilder's vision and the power of the international theater community in a Cold War world grabbed Martha, and Martha grabbed back, finally aligned with a calling that spoke to the biggest things in life, had a thrilling cast of theater artists from everywhere, and played 24-7 for the rest of her career. 
Martha took over the directorship of the International Theatre Institute, and I'm sure we'll hear more about her work as the evening goes on. Um, and she led congresses in during the Cold War, get this. Budapest, London, Moscow, West Berlin, Stockholm, Sofia, Madrid, Toronto, Montreal, Havana, Helsinki, Istanbul, Munich, Caracas, Seoul, Marseille, Athens, Manila, and Beijing. After 9-11, Martha attended six theater conferences in Cairo. In 1998, Martha and ITI got a special Tony Award exactly 40 years after Rosamund Gilder got hers. Her success hinged on her passion for the theater, her love of people, never enough hugs, never enough brownies, her <laughs> wicked tenacity, and her effortless social graces, honed at home, and her eye on the prize, dream of peace here, there, and everywhere. Little wonder that having found her feet as a professional, she also found herself in love with, and soon enough married to, the brilliant and remarkable Rodolphe Coignet, a French war hero and conspicuous citizen of the world who, and this was a major point of interest for me, had dated Cher. <laughs> This is a man who could have had a chair, but chose Martha. <laughs> well, I mean, who wouldn't? I mean. <laughs> Which is a comment somewhat on Martha. Little wonder that, yes. Uh, during rough times in the 60s, Martha also found solace and much needed sense of community at St. Clement's Church, which served the theater community both as haven of prayer and playhouse. Her mantra, she said, was, let us play. <laughs> and sure enough, she prayed and played and was instrumental in building up the theatrical wing of that church, again in every possible role. Church, she wrote once, is like an old lady trying desperately to chaperone the Beatles. <laughs> The, you know, this is the granddaughter and great-granddaughter of some serious creatures. <laughs> Martha was an independent, fully modern woman who fought against her own weaknesses, with and against her heritage, and for her entitlement in a man's world, wielding her candor, confidence, and heat-seeking wit. And all this, bravely and admirably, before the feminist movement made it okay. She burned, in the words of Walter Pater, with a hard, gem-like flame. Even after her first stroke on the way back from the Beijing conference in 2011, her sharply perceptive mind and effortless sardonic humor were up front. Her nephew, Will, who was her loving and heroic caregiver, along with his wife, Jane, uh, and organizer in her last years, writes touchingly about them. He really got to know her only then. These are his words. I never saw the power, Martha, rather the more essential, pared-down person. In some ways, I was lucky because she was alcohol-free, less cranky, less bitter, and her primary traits of empathy, humor, doggedness, and huge situational awareness all became the staples that she lived by. The first stroke removed her ability to plan and to take initiatives, and she lost her short-term memory. This resulted in sundowner syndrome, where she would become disoriented and agitated every evening and felt that she had to go somewhere. She also developed this underlying feeling late at night that she needed to go home. So she would pack her bags and repack them between 2 and 5 a.m. every night in preparation. One evening after work, I visited around 7 p.m. and found her in the lobby of 1200 Fifth Avenue, beautifully dressed as though for an opera. I asked her where she was going, and she said, to the Vassar reunion party. <laughs> Another night, she had her suitcase all packed and in hand and was well-dressed for travel. She happened to get past the doorman somehow, and I met her on the corner of 102nd and 5th, heading towards Grand Central to take a train home to Pelham. We lived with such a touching thing when I think of those times there. Um, and that incredible energy and ebullience of that household. 
Uh, we lived, says Will, still going on, we lived for three months worrying every evening she would go home to Pop and Grammy only to rediscover that they were dead. There's another story that he told me when he and um, Jane took, I guess, her father and Martha on a vacation. And um, her father was in a very crotchety old guy place. and. It was of 12 lines about what he wanted to do when, and Martha was sat quietly and peacefully in the car. Um, and both, as the hours rolled by, these guys were looking at both of them with sort of increasingly frantic concern about how they were doing, because it was intense for them. And, and, um, and Martha was totally so quiet and docile, and, and uh, the gentleman was really in a state and just hogging the time and hogging the energy and hogging the attention and just meeting, meeting, meeting. And at one point, Will said to Martha, are you okay? And she said with perfect timing, I think you better take care of Mr. Wonderful. <laughs> You know, just that little hint of a smile. Martha was classically Wadsworthy. There was a certain rigor of thought and belief, a finely honed skepticism, but an old age of enlightenment skepticism, the best kind, and verbal acuity and humor. Wry, dry, and right in the eye. <laughs> Two of our earliest ancestors were responsible for hiding a copy of the Connecticut Charter from the British in an oak tree in Hartford, hence the Charter Oak Bridge, and a legacy, at least as imagined by Martha and my father, of righteous fury, take charge initiative, and a sort of reckless, naughty cleverness. <laughs> what I learned from Martha was that we all, everyone, everywhere, had to keep putting the charter in that oak. We don't get something for nothing. Citizenship isn't a hand cream or a shoe you might be rich enough to buy. We all, everyone, everywhere, have to feed the meter, to pay it forward, to keep reinvesting through action in the beautiful idea. Being citizens of this country, of any other, or of the world, or any other community, we have responsibilities to protect communication, whether of big ideas, private truths, or national imperatives, to celebrate difference in acts of communion, be they at church, in the theater, or across a table, to step into the difficult conversation and challenge all sentient beings to listen to one another at a conference, a festival, or an embassy. It's all one. Martha was a great writer. Let me close with two quotes. In 1996, she said of post-Cold War America, what we didn't bargain for in the US was our national allergy to the rest of the world, <laughs> if there is not a war to hold our attention. In 1967, she said of being in a family, all have seemed to hold the hope that everything would be okay. The knowledge that the hope is sort of impossible and the security to watch and see and keep on doing the business of life. Acknowledge the abrasion. Acclaim the row. Accelerate the independence and approve the effort. Night, night, Martha. Stephen was now supposed to introduce Barbara Lanciers, the director of the Trust for Mutual Understanding, who helped us um, do this today. And Barbara had a death in the family yesterday and is in uh, Milwaukee right now. Uh, so I'm going to get to follow this by reading Barbara's statement. 
that she wrote when she knew she couldn't be here. Friends, family, colleagues, and fellow loved ones of Martha, I wish I could be there with you this evening to honor a woman who truly embodied the spirit of trust and mutual understanding, of creating deep, long-lasting friendships across borders. I'm writing these words wearing two intertwined hats. The first is the director of the Trust for Mutual Understanding, a foundation that supported Martha's work through the International Theater Institute for many decades. The second is a theater practitioner who sat at her feet and learned from her the importance of global connectedness and collaboration well before I entered the world of philanthropy. I'll speak through Philip, wearing that second hat first. It was Philip who introduced me to Martha when I was a young graduate student. A group of classmates and I were opening a performance at the Ontological Hysteric Theater at St. Mark's Church. Just before the show started, Philip walked in with a fabulous Martha Guanier and sat down in the audience. I knew who she was, who didn't, but I'd never seen her in person. She was wearing her signature orange lipstick, orange scarf, and matching shoes and handbag. I was terribly nervous to meet her and told her so as we exchanged our first words after the performances. She squeezed my hand kindly and said, oh dear, there's no need to be nervous. We're part of the same family. Which family is that? The family of theater, of course. <laughs> to Martha, if you were a theater person, you were a friend, which also meant that you were family. So that's when I officially joined Martha's extended family, and she proceeded to open up to my view of community to include the global theater community. Now switching to that first act, I should tell you in the spirit of full transparency that the trust for mutual understanding would not be what it is now if our founding trustees, Richard Lanier, Elizabeth McCormick and Don O'Brien had not encountered Martha Kwanye as they were working with TMU's anonymous donor to set up the foundation. Last year was TMU's 30th anniversary. In preparation for our anniversary events, I was digging through the treasure trove of historical documents and I came across the minutes from the first official meeting of the trustees which took place November 4, 1985. At that point, the, director, the direction of the foundation and its guidelines and programmatic priorities were still very much in development. Among the short list of organizations discussed at the meeting was ITI, a, semin a summary of a seminal conversation between Martha and TMU trustee and longtime director Richard Lanier was highlighted in these minutes. Martha probably, in the way Martha always did, humbly, and with a touch of wry humor, gave Richard some advice. Number one, networks are important and should be supported. Two, organizations are good, but individuals are the actual doers, and they need to be supported. Number three, Always answer your own phone. <laughs> Four, don't make grants that are restricted. And number five, theater people can change the world. The trustees must have taken this advice to heart because ITI, under Martha's leadership, was among TMU's very first grantees. Martha's influence can be felt far and wide from just about every uh, corner of the world, Martha was a person of words combined with actions. She was a person of substance, of kindness, of strength. She believed in friendship above all else, and she believed that friendship can be found even in the harshest of circumstances. I like to think that all of us at TMU 
Strive to be a little like Martha. Think a little bit like Martha. Do a little bit like Martha every day. We are all, everyone here and everyone watching, most fortunate to be counted among the members of Martha's very large and boisterous global family of theater people, Barbara Lanciers. I had the good fortune to introduce Barbara to Martha, and I think I might have introduced you to Martha Ann Bogart. I know you met her a long time ago. Um, I think it, uh, at Iowa Theater Lab, August Moon, Ann Bogart, a longtime friend and partner of Martha Kline. I'm so glad you solved that. <clears throat> Philip, because I was trying to remember when I first met Martha, and I think you're right, it was the Iowa Theater Lab in the 70s. <clears throat> so, but, 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 but my memory, and, and now I have to adjust it, because I have a different memory, but I think you're right. But the memory I uh, have conjured up is seeing Martha at various events, and I... I think one of them was at the uh, theater festival in Catskill at, uh, for the Iowa Theater Lab. It was called, what was the name of it? August Moon. August Moon. But also, I remember the first time I got to go to a TCG conference or other conferences, and she was always there, and I looked at her, and I admired her, and I thought she was so grown up <laughs> and so sophisticated. And then I, 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 I followed her around a little bit before I met her and got to be friends with her, and I watched her because after these fabulous conferences, she would go to a fabulous hotel with a lot of other people who seemed rather sophisticated, and they would sit at round tables and drink martinis or <laughs> other drinks, and she would lean back in her chair with that elegant, slender body, and she would regale tables with tails. And I was so impressed, and then to my great thrill, I was actually invited to her table and got to sit at her tables at these various conferences and events and, and festivals and listen to her stories. And they were never self-aggrandizing at all. As a matter of fact, I do believe that she is at the heart of many, many, many initiatives that happened in the last 40, 50 years in this country in the theater, and she would not admit it. If you try to accuse her of being the <coughs> inciter of these great uh, uh, things that would happen in the theater, she would say, oh, no, no, this was so-and-so and so-and-so that got together. But she was actually behind it, planning it, getting people together. I, I believe that she you know, was, was plotting, actually, constantly. <laughs> but what I learned after a while is that maybe she wasn't so grown up. I mean, look at this picture. <laughs> I actually learned that she had a childlike quality to her that was incredibly seductive and attractive and successful in terms of getting what she wanted when she had something in mind to get it done. She got it done and she appealed to people and I think not in a, a negative fem a way that one as a feminist would say that's a negative thing is to use her childish wiles, but she did it in a really wily way and that it was actually genuine, that she was always a, 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 a child in some sense and, and with a child's delight and an enthusiasm that was contagious. And towards the end, and, and she was a, a, a board member of City Company for a number of years, uh, at the end of her life, and she was always, um, and, 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 and it was pointed out by uh, Phil earlier in a discussion, her, her, her point of view was, it's so simple, just, it's so simple, of course you'll take this initiative. And, and she very much brought to our board meetings her, and we have a number of board members in, a, in with us here tonight, and you'll remember this, she brought not, her, not only her sense of humor, but her sense of, of course we're going to do this, of course. And even after her first stroke, and, and, and she came to a, a board meeting, and I don't know how much she was really with it, but ultimately she was, because there would be lots of discussion and sort of difficult 
twisted things that were discussed. You know, you know how hard board meetings can be where you just think this is impossible. <laughs> and she said after her, her stroke, she would show up with her brownies, her delicious brownies, and we would eat her brownies, and she would laugh at the end of whatever our dispute was, and she'd say, of course we can do this. And that never stopped. Her humor never stopped, and her attitude never stopped. And I, I just want to take a moment before I say one final thing I'd like to share with you, that uh, Martha's caregivers towards the end uh, should have halos on. I know Kevin Bitterman, who, who would bring her to the board meetings, I know br bring her everywhere so that she could still participate as a fully sentient, seemingly sentient human being towards the end. Um, and, and certainly her family will, as, as uh, Stephen has mentioned, are in, what they allowed her to, uh, the quality of her life is, is immeasurable because of them. That's, that's huge. And so finally, I've been thinking a lot about the word resonance because, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of emphasis in the American theater about as, a, as, a, as an artist, you know, you have to have a signature or maybe uh, be innovative or new or, or novel. And I, I never found that to be particularly interesting. But the word that has, <laughs> I'm thinking about these days is resonant, that I'd like to make work that is resonant. So I started looking up the word resonant, and it turns out that it not only means creating meaning of others, it also means in physics that it's a kind of, people can correct me later who know what they're talking about, it's something about an energy and, and a certain uh, movement, movement of molecules that, um, that communicate to another entity and give them that movement. Correct me, please. But it's, I, I, I am going to study this more. In other words, that 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 a uh, you could say the easiest example is is a production like Hamilton is resonant because it's created movement in others, and there's a great deal of of, of 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 resonance that's communicated from one to the other. And I would like to suggest that Martha's great gift was her resonance, and that in us she has set up a lot of movement, and it, it behooves us, as I think Stephen mentioned earlier to carry forward her sense of, it's simple, of course we have to do it. Of course it's not simple, of course it's complicated. Everything is twisted and difficult and becoming more difficult every year to get things done in the theater. But can we keep alive the, what, she, uh, what she gave to us, was, which is, is a sense of movement forward and uh, a sense of, it's simple, of course we can do this. So thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce you to Amelia Ketchapero, who um, I'm excited is going to speak with us because in, in the end, uh, uh, the last chapter of Martha's time with ITI was with TCG, and TCG took in ITI and Martha, and they became an entity. And I know, Amelia, you had a great deal to do with that working, and also you worked closely with her. So, Amelia, thank you. Seven twenty-one, and happy hour is over. <laughs> but on a rooftop terrace, miles above the clouds, it's sunny, always 72 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 Celsius, always happy hour, and always just before sunset. Martha and Ellen Stewart are holding court in a corner, and Mac Lowry has just ordered another round of drinks. <laughs> a waiter brings Martha a Martha. Vodka, Campari, OJ, and a splash of soda. Large vases of orchids and tulips are scattered around the terrace. Two of the Lolas are stationed beside the buffet table waiting for a Swedish meatball to fall out of the chafing dish. Rudy's distracted by de Gaulle, who's just asked him to check his pulse. Fouad al Shati is combing his hair at the mirror by the door, and Marilyn is drawn to his cologne. Jean-Pierre Guenconet has just finished telling Martha and Ellen a joke in French, but Fidel is sulking because he doesn't understand the punchline. A united, a united humanity is speaking Hungarian, Russian, Arabic, Korean, Polish, Catalan, Mandarin, and no one needs a translator. At Martha's party above the clouds, it's ever sunny, ever happy hour, and ever just before sunset. 
It's just after Labor Day in 1999, and I'm in the old TCG office on Lexington. I hear an unfamiliar voice blowing down the hall, warm and throaty, and when I look out, a tall woman with a sherbet colored real pashmina has just <laughs> rounded the corner. It's my first glimpse of Martha and her global inflected style that makes shawls and crystal and gold wire necklaces. I thought, that's who I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> but at that moment, I had no idea who she really was, what she had accomplished, or how many people she influenced. A friend once told me something that I think is right for Martha, too. Some women are meant to have one or two biological children, but others are meant to have hundreds, just not out of their own bodies. Martha had generations of children, not only in the U.S., but spread across the world. I mean, here tonight is Anne, and it's Philip, and Kevin Bitterman, and I saw Nancy Rhodes earlier. So many, so many. Michael Fields and Del Arte Blue Lake, who wrote a beautiful tribute in American Theatre magazine, captured the essence of Martha as a global catalytic force, constant co-conspirator in a field she had chosen. Amboise and Bia, ITI Cameroon. For those who personally knew and appreciated her like me, I am grateful because she contributed a lot for a better integration of African countries in the ITI worldwide. It is an unforgettable souvenir for us. Georgette Guevara, Lebanon. With me, it all began when my center sent me to represent Lebanon at the Venezuela Congress in 1995, right after we emerged from our horrible war. For some reason, she took me under her wing, and this developed into a rich, warm friendship. In between meetings, our short escapades for exotic meals, heart-to-heart -heart chats, often naughty, and oh, that very special dinner with Alona Copen in that magic place at the foot of the Acropolis where the view is incredible. Jennifer Walpole, formerly of the General Secretary at ITI Worldwide, Every time Martha arrived at the General Secretariat in Paris, it was an event. <laughs> I can see her now, just recovered from jet lag, opening the door with an armful of flowers or an exotic orchid or two. Mm -hmm. And after asking, without a hint of condescension, but with the genuine humility of the great, if she could help out in the office, she whisked us off for lunch at her favorite Italian restaurant. A moment of celebration, joie de vivre, and light belief before the long meetings began. And many, many more in Manila, Berlin, Reykjavik, Moscow, Tehran, Barcelona, Paris, Zagreb, Istanbul, and of course, in New York. Martha embodied ITI, both worldwide and in the US. She and her mentor, Rosamund Gilder, who Stephen mentioned earlier, developed the US Center of ITI, which Martha then held together for an incredible 35 years before finding its current home at TCG. 20 years after Rosamund Gilder's term as president of ITI worldwide ended, Martha became the second of only two women, both from the US, to hold the position of president and finally also that of lifelong president of honor of ITI worldwide. UNESCO recognized her strong conviction of the life-saving value of cultural exchange. In 1995, the head of the UNESCO culture sector, Madeleine Gobiel, insisted on making the trip to Venezuela to present UNESCO's highest cultural award, the Picasso Medal, personally to Martha during the ITI World Congress. Today, the Martha Coignet collection of books and articles, which were lovingly overseen by long, uh, Martha's longtime amanuensis, Lewis, resides at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts. Martha, a cross between Susan B. Anthony and Joan of Arc, as Nancy Rhodes said, had the ear of the ITI Old Boy Network and deeply, deeply understood the often obscure, obtuse, and mysterious inner workings of ITI. My first ITI World Congress was in Athens, 2002. I was so excited that Martha and Joan Chanik, who I think is here tonight, championed me to attend, and being an overachiever, I was anxious to prepare for the event that was going to be several days. I asked Martha how best to prepare, and she said, just brush up your French and bring good gifts. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, 
I arrive at ITI meetings with New York chocolates to compensate for my bad French. <laughs> In fact, it was Martha who first told me that old joke, you know. What do you call someone who speaks three languages? Trilingual. What do you call somebody who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call somebody who speaks one language? American. <laughs> In later years, I've come to associate banana bread and brownies with Martha. I think of her apartment with photos and travel mementos covering the walls and tables. I think of a fire in the belly, fueled and refueled by people-to-people -people connections, and a deep belief that the arts can accomplish things that our governments, governments more than often cannot. I'm proud to be one of Martha's global children, and can only hope that I'm doing right by her. I'm hoping for an invite to Martha's party on the rooftop terrace above the clouds, where it is ever sunny, ever happy hour, and ever just before sunset. On behalf of Teresa Iron, Kevin Bitterman, and all at TCG, a deep, deep thank you for a life well lived. Martha spent her whole life uh, with ITI, and I think it's really a, a very appropriate for you to tell us that part of the story. We have two other people here that go back further. The first is a good friend of Martha's from Poland, very accomplished translator, a critic, uh, a member of the executive committee from Poland, and sort of a real animator of the Polish ITI. Martha's good friend, Margaret Semmel. Margaret? It's very difficult to speak now after so many good words have already been said. So all the, um, that means I'm, I'm a bit tongue-tied, but I would like to say first of all that of course whoever came under Martha's spells, Martha spell was influenced. Whoever came along the way was influenced by her. My professional life was very, very influenced by Martha, too. I met her first in 1974. I was a young theatre critic. I came to this country on a visit to my relatives, and I had a letter of recommendation to the American ITI. So I walked into the office there with a letter from Ziggy, as she called, Zygmunt mm -hmm. uh, Hübner, who was the head of the Polish ITI. And I met this very, very elegant woman, and I thought that she would be sending me off to Broadway theaters and so on. And immediately she started making phone calls, and I ended up visiting Robert Anton. Does anybody remember the puppeteer? <laughs> I ended up visiting the New Rican Poets Cafe. Um, and uh, seeing for colored girls considering suicide. So that was my first encounter, which was with American theater, which was initiated by Martha. This, ended up, this, this resulted in a series of essays on American theater uh, in the Polish journal called Dialog, which, well, is a little bit similar to TDR. It's quite influential in Poland, but that was what came out of that trip. <clears throat> My next encounter was in 1976, um, and that was the result of those articles which I wrote in that time. Martha arranged for me to come to uh, the Baltimore Theatre Festival, mm -hmm. and that's when I met this gentleman. Uh, and I also met a Martha which was completely different, in blue jeans and a t-shirt, but she was also, yes, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, indeed. A completely different. Rudy was there as well. Uh, and, um, well, she was also introducing new theater to people. Uh, I remember her introducing Bob Wilson, who was quite a nobody at that time yet. Um, well, uh, there were, a lot was happening there, but when Martha brought me into this country, she decided, well, that's not enough. You can't just go to the Baltimore Theatre Festival. You must see more. You must see more. You must get in touch with people. So where did she send me? She sent me off to the Wilma Project in Philadelphia. She sent me off to New Harmony to an arts conference. 
And um, what she did was typical Martha. If you come here, you have to get totally immersed, you have to get in touch with all the people, because it's, um, who was it that Bar Barbara Lancier said, Mar quoting Martha, that it's individual personal contacts which make theater happen. And that was typical Martha, just get the person in touch with other people. So that resulted again in a whole set of articles about American theater and placed me in the position where I am today. That means knowing something about American theater, translating American plays, and here I must say also that Martha was a tremendous influence in that too because she always helped me get the rights to American plays. Now those who deal with American um, play agents know what I am talking about. But Martha used all her strings and all her possibilities to help me get hold of that. Saying that Martha was generous would be such an understatement that I can't even say it. But I profited enormously from her welcoming me in her home because afterwards whenever I came to New York she would take me in and I would stay with her and I experienced her hospitality. Very important thing was about Martha in her international activities that Martha understood Europe, which from this perspective means a lot. And she also in, in, uh, understood the political and economic problems which we were encountering uh, behind the Iron Curtain. Coming to this country, <coughs> we were allowed to bring $5. Now, <laughs> yes, that's what we were allowed to travel with. So now you understand what it meant for Martha to put me into all sorts of places where I could get to know American theater. Not only me, I was only one of the dozens of people from Eastern Europe that Martha would help along in getting to know American theater. Um, I, almost, I also must say that she was extremely sensitive to what was happening across the water. Um, so for a long time she collaborated with the previous um, um, president of the ITI, Janusz Radmiski, who also came from Poland. I remember her, me, her asking me as he was sort of running for the office, oh who is that guy, that Verminski, that vermin? She was very, very cautious, but once she learned about his do you remember that, then? Yes. You were there, too. Mm -hmm. You remember that, okay. So, so, <coughs> so once you found out who Mr. Varminsky was, I think those two were a wonderful team. And um, in the international uh, works, the two of them managed to uh, have a lot of things done. And uh, Martha, with her remarkable diplomatic skills which were mentioned here and her wit and her humor and also her uh, remarkable straightforwardness managed to get us from under our dear friends from the DDR, <laughs> from their wings, from under the wings. Uh, I would say that Martha was extremely important as an ambassador of American theater for us at, across the ocean. Um, when she sent people from this country to visit Europe, we really got the creme de la creme. So she put us in touch with John Jory uh, and we started, I mean us, meaning, meaning the Polish ITI, we started a relationship with the Humana Festival. She brought over Joe Papp. Um, I think a lot of Ellen's initiatives were also initiated and supported greatly by Martha's actions. It, it's difficult to say how many of those happens because, happened because Martha was there behind it. I've mentioned already the plays which Martha helped sort of export to Poland and from Poland also to other countries in that part of the world. I also remember very vividly um, a group of American um, theater directors which included I, Oscar Eustace, is Oscar here by any chance? Um, Robert Marx, uh, Adrian Hall, and this group came to Poland at the very, very break of martial law. 
um, Martha thought that theater in my part of the world is, is very vivid, is very important, is very strong, and it's very important for people in this country to get to learn what it, what it was like. Um, and I agree that that was a good lesson for both the Polish theater-going public and also the Americans. I have one image of Martha, which is, uh, I mentioned this elegant lady, I mentioned Martha in blue jeans, I mentioned Martha in, at home as a host, and everybody knows what Martha was like as a host. But there was also a moment, that wasn't my final encounter with Martha, but it stayed very vividly in my memory. Martha came together with Ellen to a festival in Lublin, in Poland, which was organized by Wodek uh, Staniewski, also a great admirer of Martha and someone who is greatly indebted to her. Uh, Martha came with Ellen. Ellen wasn't feeling very well, and that's an understatement. Ellen was feeling very, very badly. Martha, who wasn't all that much younger, was there all the time. She um, made sure that Ellen had the proper food, she went running around town to buy a vacuum flask. She made sure so that she could have the drink she wanted, that Ellen was comfortable at every moment that she was spending in Lublin. And I saw Martha, this grand dame, serving theater. And that's the final image which I want to have of Martha, because she was always there to serve people of the theater. Thank you. That period of the last 20 years of the Cold War, and then that strange period of post-Cold War, which is a story that really hasn't been told, uh, there were some nasty, nasty times that were happening in that region. Martha helped ITI through some very difficult times with a real partner, uh, a gentleman who's here with us tonight. He served as the Secretary General of ITI uh, for the entire length of her presidency and beyond. Uh, I know they used to talk every day. He was based in Paris, um, and that was a working relationship and a friendship that I know meant the world to her. Um, and I'm so happy to introduce to you Andre Louis Perinetti. He'll be speaking in French, and his son, Jean Marie, you're translating. So please welcome Andre Louis Perinetti. <laughs> speak in English, or I, I don't want to impose you my English, <laughs> because it is not better since a long years. Il est étrange pour moi de rédiger un texte pour Martha, car je ne suis pas triste quand je pense à elle. Je me réjouis de l'avoir rencontrée. Elle était de ceux qui vous rendent un peu plus intelligent. Et si j'ose dire, j'en ai profité pendant plus de 20 ans. It feels very strange to me to write this for Martha's memorial. Because I, I am never sad when I think of her. I rejoice so much in having met her. Martha was one of those few people who make you feel smarter. And she made me smarter for more than 20 years. <laughs> C'est en 1983 que j'ai été élu secrétaire général de l'Institut international du théâtre. Et tout le bloc de l'Est, au dernier moment, avait voté contre moi. 
à l'exception de la Pologne, déjà Solidarność. Pourquoi rapporter cette anecdote In, uh, in 1983, I was elected General Secretary of the ITI Worldwide, and the whole Eastern Bloc had voted against me, <laughs> except Poland, thanks to Solidarność. Let us remember that French President Mitterrand had just ordered the expulsion of 47 members of the Soviet Embassy. Why are we calling this? Just to remind us of the political part played at the time by the ITI, first and foremost by Martha. Elle avait des contacts réguliers avec l'ensemble des artistes de théâtre des pays de l'Est. Sans renoncer à ce qu'elle pensait, elle acceptait et maintenait des relations privilégiées avec tous ces gens. Martha did accept and maintain connections with many theatre artists from the Eastern Bloc without ever giving up on her principles, political principles. These artists were very grateful about it and they liked her as much as she liked them. How many of these people were able to travel to the States thanks to her help? Elle était devenue un agent de la paix. Mais ce ne fut pas sans malentendu. Certaines couches de la société américaine n'y étaient pas encore préparées. Je voudrais rappeler un incident majeur. C'était à l'occasion d'une session du Théâtre des Nations à Baltimore en 1987. 86, pardon. She was, she was like a peace worker. But it didn't go without any, any misunderstanding. Some parts of American society were not ready for this. I would like to recall a major incident which happened at the Festival of the Theatre of Nations in Baltimore in 1986. Le Théâtre National Britannique, sous la direction de Peter Hall, devait y présenter Animal Farm de George Orwell. Wale Soyinka, le prix Nobel nigérian, qui était alors président de l'Institut international du théâtre, avait quelques doutes sur l'orientation politique du spectacle. Je lui avais demandé d'aller voir le spectacle à Londres. Il revint en me disant qu'il s'agissait d'un brûlot anticommuniste au premier degré. Que faire? The British National Theatre, directed by Peter Hall, was supposed to present Animal Form by George Hall Orwell. Vole Soinka, Nobel Prize from Nigeria, was chairperson of the ITI worldwide, worldwide back then. And he had serious reservations about the show. So I asked him to go see it in London. Then he told me that the show was a basic anti-communist piece. What could we do? Après des négociations ardues, un accord fut conclu. Le spectacle ne faisait plus partie de la programmation officielle, mais était présenté en ouverture du festival. Bref, tout le monde était satisfait. Peter Hall, sur le chemin de Baltimore, s'arrêta à New York et donna une conférence de presse. Et il y annonça que son spectacle était censuré à Baltimore. Finally, after much negotiations, negotiating, we decided that Animal Form wouldn't be part of the official programming of the festival and would be presented at the opening ceremony instead. All were content, but on his way to Baltimore, Peter Hall organized a press conference in New York, and he declared that his show had been censored by the festival. It was a huge scandal, which we, 
which we could not ignore. Difficile de s'y opposer, en effet. J'ai accompagné Bartha à plusieurs reprises à Washington. US Information et le National Endowment for Arts, je crois que c'est comme ça, supprimaient leurs subventions. Et les pays de l'Est commencèrent leurs protestations. Martha fut exemplaire, renvoyant chacun à plus de calme. Certains pays décidèrent de boycotter le festival, mais un artiste tchèque, Povika, brava leur censure et décida de maintenir son spectacle. Martha le défendit bec et ongle, renvoyant chacun à ses études. Ce fut un immense succès. Martha et myself had to go several times to Washington to try to sort it out. The US information and the Na National Endowment for the Arts had just cancelled their funding for the festival. And the countries from the Eastern Bloc had officially protested, except the U USSR, interesting, interestingly enough. Some countries even decided to boycott the festival. Martha was doing her best to calm everyone down. She was amazing. One Czechoslovak theater director, Pavlika, was attacked on all sides as he had decided to ignore the boycott and maintain his show. Martha defended him tooth and nail. The show was a huge success and our honor was safe. Martha fut élue l'année suivante présidente de l'Institut international du théâtre et fut renouvelée trois fois de suite. Seule à ce jour à avoir exercé quatre mandats successifs. The following year, Martha was elected chairperson of ITI worldwide. She would be elected three times in a row, which is a record. Le temps me manque pour rappeler tous les incidents que nous eûmes à affronter avec une Martha au caractère de fer. Elle ne, sordait, elle ne cédait sur rien si les droits élémentaires de la démocratie étaient attaqués. Mais elle maintenait le contact. I unfortunately don't have enough time to recall all the battles we fought together. She was an iron lady. She never gave up on the democratic values, but always kept in touch with the other side. Je voudrais associer à l'hommage qui lui est rendu aujourd'hui le rappel de la présence exceptionnelle de son mari, Rodolphe Coigné. À ce propos, mais ce serait trop long, trop long à raconter, l'épisode auquel il participa à la demande du général de Gaulle. La libération anticipée des déportés françaises de Ravensbrück, trois mois avant la fin de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Avec les coignées, on a toujours vécu à une certaine hauteur. I would like to commend her husband, Rodolphe, who was a powerful presence at her side. Did you know that three months before the end of World, World War II, Rodolphe Coignet was asked by the General de Gaulle to negotiate the liberation of the French women who had been deported to the con concentration camp of Ravensbrück. Another way of saying that with Mr. and Mrs. Coignet, the bar was set very high. <laughs> Martha fut un phare pour indiquer une bo la bonne direction dans un monde souvent obscur. Et puis cerise sur le gâteau, ce ne fut jamais triste. Nous nous sommes beaucoup amusés. À bientôt, Martha. Martha Kwani was a beacon in a very dark time, showing the right direction. But last but, last but not least, working with her was a true delight and we had so many laughter. See ya, Martha. Martha should have the last word. 
But before I give Martha the stage, uh, I really am glad you read some of the communications that TCG ITI has been getting. Uh, I've been getting a lot. I'm only going to read you three. Very short one from Bulgaria. I think I've got a dozen emails from Bulgaria in the last five days. But this is from a dear friend of Martha's um, who was an actor and then became the Minister of Culture and was responsible for Edward Albee's The Goat, who are, or Who is Sylvia, uh, to be first produced there. Uh, Stefan Danilov. A remarkable woman has left us. A woman with an enormous heart in love with theater and the arts. A great and true friend of Bulgaria. I love that woman because she embodied the most important values of our modern humanity. Love of mankind and the ability to acknowledge without haughtiness the talent that knows no borders. And then a short note from Peter Brook. For Martha's Day, July 11th, 2016, all the world's a stage, vivified, refreshed, and helped with loving care over the years by Martha. When someone's life work proves they are irreplaceable, quite simply, they can't be replaced. But Martha's work is a living reminder and example. Peter Brook Paris. And the last thing before I give the stage to Martha uh, is a note I got from Wodek Stanievski, the Polish director of Garjanica, who was calling me saying he was going to try to get here, try to get here. And uh, two nights ago, uh, he wrote this, I want you to know that here in Garjanica, we commemorate Martha Kwanye's name before every public performance this weekend. I'm speaking about her to our public, and we, the actors and the musicians, are singing a song of her memory. So that's happening tonight in Lublin, Poland. And now we're going to let Martha have the last word. How many Russians have I fallen in love with since I worked at the International Theatre Institute? It's probably too many to count. But one of the one of the first ones that I met and remained a sort of touchstone in a way was Mikhail Zolyev because he was the head of the Soviet delegation when they came to New York for the Congress. And, uh, in that sense, he was the first official ITI person from from Russia that I really met, and uh, he stayed. I knew him through a period of about 15 years because he was the executive committee representative from Moscow, and I was, as of '71, the same from New York. But it was uh, it was just his his sense of being. He was a very clear. Soviet representative, but he also was a wonderful older actor, and he he was one of the people that that showed the power of theater to climb through um, national differences and just get down to getting the work done. And he was completely um, official when it needed to be, but but he was uh, an extraordinary friend and human being when he was talking about theater and uh, and he was very clear I mean it was it was it was a pleasure like Mar Margaret Thatcher said about Gorbachev we can do business together and we, we had even though he was very solid on one side and I was pretty solid on the other we didn't let it get in the way of getting the work done because theater was going to solve everything anyway and he was he was uh, I remember he was quite official and he was not overly forthcoming. I mean, he did not take stage and, and stuff, but one of the one of the executive committee meetings in Paris was coincided with his 80th birthday. So the French um, 
woman that was head of ITI and I planned a surprise and, and at the break in the morning meeting I said uh, there is a young person here who has an important birthday and we need to uh, stop and pay attention to it and Gabrielle brought in a tray full of champagne glasses and, and a couple of bottles and, and Sayoff burst into tears. I mean, he, he was, it didn't show too much, but he was just completely bouleversé. And it was, it was, uh, that's, that's where his heart, um, that's where his identity rested, really, was in his affection for theater people and his sentimentality and his, his, that's why he said, he said, uh, theater people know better how to make peace than anyone else. Did you ever see him perform? No, really, you just, uh -huh, you just knew him. The only time I saw him perform was the last plenary session at the Congress in New York, which took place the same week as the Six Day War in the Middle East. And on the Friday of that week, about 60 or 70 of us went over to the United Nations to watch the emergency uh, General Assembly. And the next morning, Sadiyev got up in the closing session of the Congress and said, all week we have been discussing and arguing and deciding about theater in the world, and yesterday we went over to watch the diplomats um, deal with the, the Middle East, and, and we watched for an hour or so, and he paused like an old actor and said we are the diplomats we meet at the what could be the end of the world but we make peace we are the diplomats and so it was it was it got a huge laugh but it was true yeah. I mean, it was it really was one of the things that i was going to do the congress and mop up afterwards and and then i was going to go do some production work and I never left ITI because of that week hmm. because it was doing something that the world needed one one artist at a time and uh, Sarajevo was certainly one of those. <laughs>